everyone. The Museum of Tolerance and Beth Jacob Hebrew Congregation are delighted to partner in the presentation for the first time, hosting the book launch of an extremely important work by Alice Schoenfeld, entitled From Umbar to Beverly Hills, A Survivor's Journey. The absolutely outstanding turnout this afternoon is a magnificent testament to the love and the esteem with which Alice Schoenfeld is held in our community. It is also an exquisite tribute to the value and importance of Alice's accomplishment in documenting this memoir. Beth Jacob and the museum decided deliberately to schedule this book launch during the week of Yom HaShoah, a time unavoidably of darkness and sadness. But the arrival on the scene of another memoir by a Holocaust survivor means another family remembered, and every family must be remembered. And every Holocaust survivor memoir and story is a triumphant celebration of life. It inspires all of us with a profound lesson from the Shoah, ironically, not to lose faith and hope, to believe in humanity in the future and in the continuity of the Jewish people. It is my pleasure to call on Rabbi Top, the Morad Atra of Beth Jacob congregation, to say a few words. so much and it's really an honor for Beth Jacob to partner uh, with the Museum of Tolerance for this very important event and a real privilege, a great privilege to be here with Alice and with her family and friends and all of you. Such a great turnout. This is not an ordinary book launch. Uh, this event is for the launch of a book that tells an extraordinary story of survival. It's a book that I found to be engaging, endearing, <coughs> Uh, frightening, and ultimately very uplifting and inspiring. And I think that it's a book that should be read, should be thought about, and it should be studied. And today, as Liba just mentioned, we're between Yom HaShoah and Yom HaTzmoth, but also today, as many of you know, is the day of Rosh Chodesh, which is the day that the Jewish people celebrate, the beginning of the lunar month, the new moon. And it's interesting that Jewish tradition views Rosh Chodesh, the beginning of the Chodesh, the beginning of the month, Chodesh meaning renewal, as a holiday for women. What's the reason for this? Why does Jewish tradition view Rosh Chodesh as a holiday, quasi-holiday at least, for women? And the reason is that during the oppression in Egypt over 3,300 years ago, many people wanted to give up, they wanted to give in. They didn't want to continue building families because after all, uh, men were saying to women, women were saying to men, why should we have children? Because the children would either be killed, and if they're not killed, then they're just going to be forced to do slave labor. So what's the purpose of it all? However, there were some people, particularly the Nashim Tzidkaniyot, the righteous women in Egypt, the rabbis say, who had tremendous faith and hope even during those very difficult days. Shufra and Pua, the midwives risked their lives to save Jewish children. Miriam, the young girl, convinced her parents, Amram and Yocheved, to get back together, to have hope, to keep their heads up, and to continue having children. And they eventually had a child, Moshe, Moses, who went on, of course, to lead the Jewish people out of Egypt. Bizchut nashem tzidkani yod nigalu b'nei Yisroi Mitzrayim. It was the merit of these righteous and courageous women that clinched the redemption. These women have faith, courage, and optimism, even during the darkest of times. And so Rosh Chodesh, the beginning of the lunar month, is the day when we begin to see the sliver of the new moon. It's a small light that is there in a dark sky. But we know that over the coming days of the lunar month, the moon will grow and the light will get stronger and the moon will get bigger. And so Rosh Chodesh is really a beautiful message that reminds us of hope, to have hope, to have optimism.
optimism in the future of Israel and in making the world a better place, a place where redemption can happen. So it became the holiday for women because it was the righteous, it were the righteous women in Egypt who had this faith and optimism in the future. And also they had the courage and faith that they could help make that better future happen. The Alice Schoenfeld, to me, is a modern day equivalent of the Nashir Tzidkani of the Mitzrayim, those righteous women in Egypt. Her book, From Ungvar to Beverly Hills, is written in a beautiful way, a humble way, an elegant fashion. And it tells a dramatic story you're going to hear and, if you did, and you're going to read, hopefully, of a young girl and family who, like Shifrin Pua, the midwives in Egypt, and like Miriam, the young girl speaking to her parents. Alice never gave up, had tremendous courage and optimism, determination to survive, and kept faith during and after um, the dark days. Alice and Oscar, all of us shalom, whose spirit is with us today, were confronted by an evil group who wanted to defeat them and the Jewish people. But Alice and Oscar were victorious in building a beautiful family, children, grandchildren, and by being instrumental builders, really builders, literally, of the Los Angeles Jewish community and the Yishuv in Eretz Yisrael. And everywhere you go in Beth Jacob, you walk through the main sanctuary, you walk through the building, you see and you feel the fingerprints of Alice and Oscar and the Schoenfeld family, and their founders are pillars of Shalhevet, Hillel, Shari Tzedek, Barilan, and other important institutions. Alice was confronted by a world of darkness, but she responded both as a young child and then as an adult in America by living a life full of light. Alice was confronted by a world of hate, and she responded with tremendous love for people, for her family, and for her friends. She was confronted by a world of impurity, of defilement, of cruelty, and she responded by living a life of integrity, regally, majestically. It's such a delight to see Alice on Shabbat morning in shul or otherwise, where her radiance fills the room. She has boundless energy. Her boisterous personality and opinions are always thought-provoking and on the money. I get how many emails a week or a day from Alice? <laughs> Just keeping me up on the news, giving me a heads up about different things happening in Israel and America. Issues of importance, not petty issues, issues of importance to the Jewish community. Things that maybe just have, um, are, are, are sweet and sometimes big, important issues. So we are really blessed to have Alice as a member of our community. We're blessed now to have this book that will serve as an inspiration to so many, so many so Alice, mazal tov on this tremendous accomplishment. May you go mechayel chayel in strength and happiness. Ad mei adi esrim until after death. Thank you, David. The value of a memoir is immense on many levels. Certainly it has a profound effect on the person who's writing the memoir. But what starts out as a personal story very often becomes a genealogical study and evolves into a generational activity as children and grandchildren and subsequent generations are interested in and yearn to know about and to perpetuate the legacy of their forebearers. It is also significant for all of those of us who become part of that story by hearing it. Elie Wiesel said, he is quite convinced and profoundly believes that to listen to a survivor, to a witness, is to become a witness. And so, Alice, we thank you for making us witnesses to this important chapter of history and to inspiring us with the ultimate uplifting message, which I agree with Rabbi Top as the, the ultimate uh, success of the book. And with words of great appreciation and of bracha, it is my pleasure to introduce Alice Schoenfeld. Thank you, Rabbi Top, and thank you, Liba, for these beautiful words. I only have a few words to, to start with. <coughs> By now you know my name is Alice Schoenfeld. I'm an all-time member of the Jacob Congregation and a long-time supporter of the Wiesenthal Center. 
I'm here to acquaint you with my book. I wrote this book with the idea that my children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren should remember the catastrophic events that befell us Jews during the Second World War. It is also easier to discuss a book leafing through it, through the pages, and ask questions. As you will hopefully buy and read the book, you may question the fact that we were not interned neither in Auschwitz nor in any other concentration camp. My story is different. We were lucky. We took a chance, not really knowing what the outcome will be. But we had to try. One can always die later. The Wiesenthal Center has been most generous in allowing us to use this theater. I wish to thank Lieber Geft for suggesting and arranging this event. And I wish to thank Rabbi Haya for reading my book and writing a very favorable note. Thank you also to Rabbi Abner Weiss and Dr. Michael Berenbaum, both of whom wrote a lovely introduction. I wish to mention Tom Fields Mayer, who helped me edit the book and bring it to its conclusion. <clears throat> I'm very happy to see members of my immediate family here. My son, Alan, and Elisa, and Jordan, my grandson, my sister, Edith Berger, my sister-in-law, Ilona Brown, and daughter, Esti Surkin, Eddie Markley and Eileen, cousin Susie Isaacs, Rosie and Leon Small, Steve Berger and Rifki, and uh, baby Aviva. Thank you one and all, and uh, we'll continue now with questions. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to invite Alice to take a seat next to me um, and invite all of you to drop in on our conversation and add your questions along the way. Thank you.
were taken uh, with a smuggler over the border, but he didn't take us children. A few days later, we heard they were caught and returned, and to our luck, in a sense, they were put in jail. This was the time between Pesach and, and Shavuot. They were seven weeks in jail as smugglers. That was our luck, because otherwise they would have been put onto Auschwitz on the trains. And then we wound up in the city of Ungwar, which was actually my birth city, and my parents had lived there for many years. And my grandmother lived not far away, so my parents could not stay in the city, as many people knew them, and it was dangerous for them. But my sister and I, we were taken to my grandmother, and we stayed there. Whereas, um, during the summer, my parents were taken to the city of Debrecen. But while we were at my grandmother's during the summer, since everybody said I looked like my mother, uh, people knew her in that village. And they said, well, they know we moved to Slovakia. Somehow everybody knew it. So how come I am there? But of course, being that I was a young child, it was summer, I could be there on vacation. But one day, we hear banging on the door, and uh, who comes? Uh, these gendarmes, the Hungarians, they had these huge feathers, they're very fierce looking, and they started to interrogate. Luckily, my aunt, Flori, who was a wonderful, wonderful, lively person, she was able to mollify them. But I'm told that I was as white as a sheet. If they had to start asking me, I probably would have fallen apart. In any case, then, from there, I had to move uh, to join my parents in the city of Debrecen in Hungary because uh, being the age of school, I couldn't stay any longer there. Uh, so we wound up living in Debrecen, um, again, as um, Jewish illegal immigrants. We had papers, but we were hoping that nobody will ever stop us to look at our papers because uh, I don't know how original they were. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, um, we had, um, we lived in this uh, one room with this uh, elderly widow lady, middle-aged, not elderly, why don't I, middle-aged really. And um, my mother was very helpful. She was a wonderful, wonderful person too. She helped, she worked, she shared with this lady that time, the Hungarians were fighting alongside the Nazis against the Russians. So this lady was doing, um, she was sewing, uh, they were sewing camouflage suits, white camouflage suits, and mother was helping to sew camouflage suits. Uh, also, at that place, we had acquired somehow a little chicken. My sister, who was at that time, uh, what's it? it was 42, 43, she was uh, five or six, not even. She loved that little chicken. She taught that chicken to dance, a Hungarian chardash dance. And everything was great until the chicken had to get to the shoyfet. <laughs> so we lived in, in fear most of the time, most of the time. It was, and then, you know, uh, we had some relatives in the in the city of Debrecen, and there was uh, one place. Thank you. Uh, I could not go to school there, even though I was uh, I was taken to the Jewish school. I went, but we were at the moment there was an inspection. I had to leave the room, so it was too often that I was not there more than. Yes. And then, uh, so this went on for about two years, on and off. In 1944, March 19th, the Germans marched in. And for whatever reason, I guess my parents, my mother, decided not, not to go along, not to go in, not to follow, even though we wore the yellow star. We were able to, someone was helping us to get some false papers some Christian papers, and my mother had her coat on with a 
star here, the yellow star, then she put on another coat and went to the city hall, had the, <coughs> the chutzpah, so to speak, to walk in there and ask for a copy of birth certificate and uh, whatever papers you needed there at that time to exist. And that's what that's what we had, and we moved away from there. We felt nobody knows us. We really perhaps not even um, uh, registered anywhere. So we moved to another part of the city. So basically everything happened to us in Debrecen until we were liberated. Let's then fast forward and find out where were you at the time of liberation and what recollections you have of that moment. Uh, there were bombings in between. The Allies were bombing. Uh, the ghetto was bombed in 1944. Then later on, there were other bombings. We lived in this house. We had a villa, where we, which we kind of uh, not inherited, but got it from someone. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, there was this big bombing going on, and three, four nights in a row. So we, we, had, we ran down to the cellar and had a wooden um, bathtub on top of our heads and of course crying Shema Israel, thank God we were safe. Uh, we were staying in this villa and one day we see people, so I think it was a Sunday, going past our, the, the building and we ask, where are you going? Well, you know, the Russians are coming closer and we are going to this uh, shelter from the university because that's the only place where we may be safe. Well, we could not say we are not going to go, that we will welcome the Russians, you know, liberators. We wound up going and being there four weeks underground in that shelter until we were liberated by the Russians. And uh, it, was, it was an elation, and yet we were afraid of them because they were very barbarous. <laughs> We were afraid of them. But uh, thank God, as you identified yourself as a dear Ray, they left you alone. Clearly, this was a time of, of, of trauma, um, being very frightened, being constantly fearful of being discovered, not knowing what's going to happen from one minute to the next. <coughs> and yet, you write in your, in, in, in your book, Through the Eyes of the Child, um, of a very happy, existence. And I got a sense from that of the profound appreciation for family and the value of the ways in which parents can protect their children, even in these unusual is too euphemistic a term, in these ex <coughs> extraordinary uh, harsh circumstances that, that a child can still feel even isolated and even with a profound understanding that something is going on here that is very bad still feel happy about their reflections back on their childhood. Can you tell us more about that? Well, my, uh, I have to say that my parents were extraordinary, especially my mother. She was really the go-getter and the mover. And we were lucky that we were never separated during those times. Just uh, one of those things. We never even thought that we could be separated. Come to think of it now. But we were always together. We, whatever was done, was done together. And it's actually quite miraculous that the family was able yes. to stay together. Yes. Very unusual. Yes. For those who were returning after the war, you write about their fascination to find a whole family intact, okay. and how they loved to be around you because you were a whole new family. Yes, family. we represented a lot for these, especially people who came back alone. And definitely, we represented a lot. They loved to be with us. But my mother gave after a while, it was enough. She says, I can't cook so much. We had to move to another place because we were always surrounded with people. But uh, yes, it was a miracle of the time of, for us. Before I go to questions from the audience, and I encourage you to just raise your hands if you do have one, we, we'll get to you in, in the order that I spot you. I want to ask about the time at which you decided to put this down, because writing it down can often make it very, very real. And you, in essence, create 
a record in a historical context, which many people who've written memoirs and many tutors who teach how to write memoirs claim has great therapeutic value. Do you feel that this process and this journey has been in any way a healing experience for you? I don't know if I looked at it that way. I really, I just, uh, I remember we did the video for the Shoah many years back. And I said to myself, well, no one is really looking. Every, every video is up on the top shelf. And uh, who is kind of uh, looking at it? How often? So I, I, I guess I had the time or suddenly I had the urge to sit and write. I don't know if I thought what it will be the ending or how it will come out. It, it's just one of those feelings. And I, I'm glad I never, I didn't give up. Every writer will tell you that the value of writing a memoir has nothing to do with the technique of writing, but everything to do with building trust, trust with those with whom you're going to share that story. You said that you started out just writing it for your own children and grandchildren. You're graciously now sharing it with your friends, with your community, and it will become part of the literature and the documentation of the Shoah. Have you contemplated the enormity of you no, know, I'm very excited. No, I did not. I just, uh, you know, no, uh, I really, that I that we finished it, Tom was helping me to edit it and finish it. And then I came to you, I showed you the book, and you said we should do something more. And I'm very excited. Yes, thank you. It's wonderful <laughs> to see that come uh, to fruition. I'm looking around for hands, and I'm going yeah, to turn because there. there's a whole lot more to the story than I can <coughs>
is since Alice was very young as a child and most of her experience was in some form trying to hide, did she have any difficulties relaying that to her children and grandchildren? Well, we did the show on a video, so I guess that was the beginning that we had already talked, my husband and I, maybe not all the time, uh, maybe not in detail, but I think overall they, they did get to know my story. When did you meet your husband, and how did he survive the Shoah? The question is, when did Alice meet her husband, and how did he survive the Shoah? Uh, I, I met him at the end of our being in Germany, almost to the end, and uh, uh, that was, and then he came out to America first, and we followed, and he came to Los Angeles. And I, we, my parents and I, we stayed in New York. He uh, was doing a lot of um, um, all kind of papers that he was uh, making false papers. He was working with the Bricha uh, underground. Uh, as a matter of, and um, as a matter of fact, he was caught by the Germans. He was uh, in a jail, and uh, with very difficulties, but. He survived. He was always a go-getter and managed to be up there ahead of the few steps that were here. He was always ahead. And we had then gotten married um, in 1952. Where, where? In New York, in the Grand Concourse Hotel. <laughs> in the Grand Concourse Hotel. But after two days, they showed him a tiny room. And yes, after two days, we, I came. I followed him to Los Angeles. It was the first time I sat on no, yeah, first time I sat on an airplane. It took us ten hours to come from New York to Los Angeles. And how soon after that did you, your parents uh, follow you? Um, my parents about a year later, about a year later. So we were, thank God, again all together. So now you understand the degree to which the Schoenfels really are the stalwart founders of this venerable community in Los Angeles. It's yeah. a wonderful story. Your question, please. Um, you start your book out, I managed to read like about five pages, um, at age nine, and also when Leva asked you a question. But what about your life before that, when you were still a child, and what you remember growing up, or maybe even among the just general Slovak community? Um, the question is for earlier memories than the nine-year-old with which the book starts out, um, what recollections of those early childhood within the Slovak community? Well, I, I went to Jewish school. It was a school in the city of Preshov. It was in a large area where everything was there. The, the school, the shoychet, and a lot of things. And I, I have friends. I have a, girl, a friend here in town, which her father was a, uh, um, he had all kind of textiles, and he had samples. We used to go up to her house and play with dolls with samples. And then also, we had this, um, just a normal childhood. I can't exactly say that I did anything special that would stay in my memory. I do remember why this, uh, Walking past, we, we were very um, we were very scared of a cemetery or priest. I remember we always walked across the street not to not to go by the church. But as far as the regular normal childhood days, I, I don't think there was any more. Uh, perhaps I played at that time with dolls, but later it didn't exist. I didn't have that. It's a little ironic what you say about cemeteries because later on you actually took refuge hiding in those right. cemeteries uh, right. for a period of time. Okay. Your question. Okay, so first I have a comment. Our family and the Schoenfelds actually go back a long time. My father, Tiffan Olibrafa, and Mr. Schoenfelds were not smart. So and let me just tell everybody that Ayana Oris is telling us that uh, her family, to the Schoenfelds, being a and going back a long way. I want to say that Mr. Schoenfeld was really 
super, super special to all. My parents came here in 1960, and all the Grine always had some place to go to because Mr. Schoenfeld took everybody in to work in his place to start out until they got themselves organized. So Mr. 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 Schoenfeld welcome all of the newcomers, the Grine, yes. as they yes. were called, <laughs> giving them employment and right. taking them so under that, his that was Your question, please. Exactly. And then the question was, I was curious, which DP camp which so DP camp was Alice in? Because Ayala was born in a DP uh, camp. I was in Wetzlar, about two hours from Frankfurt. I don't know in which direction it goes, okay. but uh, it was a large one. There were like 4,000 people in there. Uh, yes, but uh, anyway, you can read it in the book on the details. <laughs> <laughs> any, any other hands waving? No. Please, your question. Um, I'm Tom, and I. I Let me tell the audience that we had the privilege of meeting the person who helped Alice on working, on writing, on editing, uh, on, editing on editing the book. So thank you very much for thank your, you. your, your role. Thank you, Tom. Um, I know that, excuse me, one of the things that was really important to you was to tell the story from the point of view of the girl that you were, not with the perspective you have now as an adult looking back at, at and you wanted to tell the story in a way that that showed that point of view. You didn't really understand all the events going on in the world around you. But looking back on it, it's really, it is, as you said, quite extraordinary that your family all stayed together. It's, it's really unusual. And it really, I think, says something about your parents um, and their ability to keep the family together and also to, to create the, the kind of children who were so resilient that still went on to be uh, pillars of the community. So I'm wondering if you can talk a bit about your parents uh, both uh, during and before the war, but also when they came here and what, uh, what their lives were like here, and, and if they ever talked to you about uh, the events of the show. So let me briefly summarize. Tom is um, reiterating that what was very important to Alice was that she tell the story from the perspective of the, of the young child that she was at the time, and not with the benefit of hindsight or from the knowledge and views of, of an adult that, that she is now. And it's a remarkable tribute to her parents that she could do that and that they were able to stay together and raise such resilient children. Tom is asking that Anna share a little bit more with us about her parents and about their lives after they came to the United States. And did they ever share their thoughts and their feelings about the experience at the time afterwards? Well, you know, when we all came to the United States, later to Los Angeles, we didn't have time to dwell upon the old things or whatever happened. Everybody had to go find work, find a, make a living. Perhaps we did talk about some things along the way. But I don't remember really elaborating. We all knew what we knew, and maybe we didn't want to be reminded of more, more things. And so it Every once in a while something came up, but not in a direct way, not that I recall. And, you know, mother has been now gone for 15 years, so it's hard to uh, really think back on all the details. But uh, they came, my mother was always very much interested in education, uh, and um, they, they worked very hard throughout all their lives. See, they felt they had to make up with the work and making some monies uh, now in this new land, only because they couldn't do it during the war years. So it was total hard work and ambition. Talking about the, the treasures and the memories that do come back when you speak with family, when you sit down to write a memoir, one of the valuable um, outcomes of including pictures and documents and looking through um, artifacts and giving interpretation to events is that you remember language and culture that also can be lost and forgotten. It's not just about people. And we often are the beneficiaries in, in reclaiming 
some of the jokes, the stories, the recipes, the songs, the dances. You mentioned the dancing chicken to a Hungarian <laughs> dance, but I'm wondering if there's anything else yeah. that, that is near and dear that, that you look at your sister uh, yeah, and smile. <laughs> she was the one what involved else, with what the else, chicken. What else did you, you reclaim of, of the language and the culture of the lives that were once? My mother and both of them were very dignified, very, very honest, straightforward people. And I, I, hopefully we both have inherited that trait and we're able to partake, give it away or give it to my children the same way because uh, it was very important. And indeed you have. Finally, you may think that you finished the project, but very often writing a memoir is just the start. Um, and it can set off different phases of the journey, taking children back to visit countries of origin, continuing uh, to document events, to reflect and continue the intergenerational conversation, sometimes on Facebook and blogs and uh, through, through media. Has any of that extended, continued journey already begun? For you? No, no, not yet. I wanted to get this going first and let's see what develops from here. I haven't gotten to, I'm not on Facebook, so <laughs> <laughs> my children are, but so we'll see what uh, what goes on from here. I, I don't know, perhaps I will be speaking in some places if I will be invited. We'll see. So I'm going to give the last word to Alice's family because I see that her sister has a hand up and so does her son.
at that time it was Hayas who brought us, so they waited for us in New York on 110th Street, that's where I, and Broadway. And then they took us to their home, and they just didn't know what to do with us. Also, um, uh, Mrs. Leitner took me shopping, of course. We went to Orbach's. It was the big thing in those days. And I was supposed to choose a coat. Uh, it was uh, uh, September or whatever, before the Rosh Hashanah in that year. I was supposed to choose a coat. There were so many that I tried, I don't know, I, I, couldn't, I, I, I didn't know what to do. It sounded like I'm an obnoxious girl coming from uh, Germany from the camps and don't know how to even choose a coat. It was really a strange feeling. Finally, I wound up getting a beautiful white colored coat. And uh, they, they constantly helped us. They constantly came to us. We were in their house. And we kept up a wonderful, wonderful relationship. I have a picture of, the, of uh, Marty Leitner and his young bride in the book. And uh, it was really a, a wonderful, wonderful uh, experience to be with them. And uh, with, uh, with Marty, we kept up until he just died a few years ago. We were very friendly. It was a nice you had, had the last word. <laughs> Thanks. I don't have a question, but on behalf of the, right. on behalf of the family, uh, my wife, Elisa, my son, Jordan, our kids in, who live in New York right now, um, Esther and Eddie and, and David and... Uh, and Barbara and their families. We want to really um, express our appreciation and gratitude to my mom and what a great accomplishment she really did. I mean, at her age and everything, just really, it's really, it's beautiful. And we're very proud of her. And we only wish you the best. And um, and you should just go from strength to strength. And, Jester, a good friend of the family, for videotaping it, so it'll be on YouTube, hopefully by tomorrow morning, and then everyone can see it. Thank you. Thank you for that. It is our pleasure to thank Alice again, and I present you with love, uh, flowers that you came from your friends. And we invite everyone, please, uh, to sit down with Alice and let her sign the copy of the book that, that you acquired this afternoon. Enjoy some more of the refreshments which are very graciously provided thanks to the festival. And thank you all very much indeed for helping us celebrate this.